subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and welcome. Welcome to African history, your history, my history. I mean, this is where we study about ourselves. This is where we try as much as possible to be informed about where we have come from, where we are, and where we are heading towards. It's only through our history, my history, your history, and our history. It's African history time. It is history time. Today, we, we, it's a continuation of what we did last week. Um, and the name is, might sound, but it's not a big name. We are looking at the Bantus once again. The Bantus once again. The last time we looked at the origin and the spread. In fact, this is a continuation of what we did. But then last time was primarily on the spread of the Bantus. Where did they come from? And where are they now? The likelihood of them having migrated from somewhere to their present location is what we discussed the last time. And it was done through the help of linguistics. And as students of African history who are seriously into, into African history, we discussed the sources of African history. And I, I know um, when we mention linguistics, you know what it is. You understand perfectly well linguistics, the merits and demerits of linguistics. Quite apart from that, we have other sources like um, um, numismatics, we have oral tradition, we have archaeology, and the rest. I know you know this, and that's the beauty of being um, avid lovers of African history. Thank you so much. Today we are moving on to something else. Today we'll be looking at um, the indigenous economy and the social and political organization of the Bantu people. That is exactly what we'll be looking at. But before we zoom into that, it is important we remind ourselves of what we did a little last week. All right. So Bantu. What does Bantu mean? Let's remind ourselves of the word Bantu. The word Bantu means the people. It is a plural form of Muntu, which means a person. The term is generally applied to a group of some 400 or more languages as well as their speakers. These languages include Luganda, spoken in Uganda, Kikuyu, spoken in Kenya, Kiswahili, spoken in Tanzania, Shona, spoken in Zimbabwe. The Bantu-speaking people number about 100 million people, 100 million people today, and they are found currently in over 27 countries, including Angola, Botswana. Now, this is what I want you to do. As we mentioned the countries, what I, the first assignment for you to do is that you will be writing down the capital cities of these countries. So, um, the, the Bantus can now be found in over 27 countries. And now the countries are Angola. So you tell me the capital city of Angola, Botswana. You tell me the capital city of Botswana. So whichever school you are, from Pope John, from Okapman, wherever, kindly put it down. Kindly um, write me um, the capital cities of these countries. And I, I think you should be able to do this. Botswana, Gaborone, I know you do. Burundi, Cameroon, Central Africa Republic. Re Republic, I'm sorry. Um, Comoros Islands, Comoros Islands, Congo, DRC, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Kenya, Lesotho, Madagascar, Malawi, Mayotte, Mozambique, Namibia, Nigeria, Rwanda, Somalia, South Africa, and Sudan. I mean, these are places where Bantus can be found. These are places where Bantus can be found. And as we did the last time, we looked at where the Bantus migrated from to their present location, to places of this nature. I mean, these countries primarily are in Eastern Africa and Central Africa and Southern Africa. Where did they come from to this um, present location? And so far, we've mentioned some countries, and I want you to, as I, I said earlier, write down their capital cities. Others are Swaziland, Tanzania, and Uganda. Individual ethnic groups include the Zulu of South Africa, Kikuyu, Kamba, and Luja of Kenya, Buganda of Uganda. And Buganda is so significant um, that this movie that um, has garnered so much support, um, it's an African movie, was shot in the US. It was, it was acted 
um, mimicking the, Buga the kingdom of B Buganda, the kingdom of M Buganda of Uganda. All right, so when I remember, I'll, I'll tell you the name. So Shona of Zimbabwe, Luba of Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Hutu of Rwanda. And of course, when I, I mention Hutu, I know um, quickly your minds will uh, be averted to, to something in, in Rwanda. I mean, unfortunate, but you, Rwanda has come back strong, and we are proud of you, uh, Rwanda. And that is how um, African nations, uh, we build back whenever we fall. All right, so a picture in your shots is the map of Africa, but it is showing you the concentration where the Bantus can be found, the Bantu area. So the Bantus occupy a huge area, and that's why we're saying about 100 million people in over 27 countries um, have Bantu origin. In other words, they belong to the Bantu family. The white spotted areas down south in, in, in the, south, the southern part of Africa, these areas are not part of the Bantus. Why? Because the white spotted areas, um, these areas were primarily indigenous areas. So there, the influence of the Bantus were, was not felt there. They were mainly um, the, the Khoi Khois and the, you know, these are um, indigenous people in the southern parts of the continent. But where you, you see brown, all these areas um, have Bantu influence. All right, so again, we discuss, among other factors, the population explosion as one of the factors which contributed to the spread of the Bantus to their present location. So if the Bantus originally were not from the southern, eastern, and central Africa, then where did they come from? We'll get to know. Of course, last week we did, but we are saying that one of the causes for, for the Bantus to find themselves in where they are today was because of population explosion population explosion. And we said the explosion took place at the Middle Benue River Valley area in eastern Nigeria. The popularity and spread of the Southeast Asian food of taro was another factor which further contributed to the spread of the Bantus. So we are saying the original home of the Bantus was in West Africa, but due to certain factors, they migrated from their original home and migrated down south to where they are today in eastern, southern, and central Africa. One of the factors was population explosion, and the second factor which we are looking at, and we did last week, was the, uh, the experience of the Southeast Asian food which they came across. And the Southeast Asian food, I think we all like it. Um, last week we said it, and so when I show you the picture, it will serve as a reminder. Later, the Bantus became farmers and herdsmen rather than fishermen. They grew banana, taro, cereals, and smelted iron. The adoption of the Southeast Asian foods resulted in population explosion again. This saw the migration of the Bantus further south beyond the Zambezi Valley. And Zambezi Valley is down south of the continent. All right, so in your shots, it's a picture of taro. And in our local parlance, brobe. And I know you all love brobe, and, and as much as I also do. And so this was a food that caught up with the migrants from um, the Nigeria region. And as they were coming and they were eating brobe, they were happy. And so it also led in much more population growth. All right, so in your, in your shot is taro. It is again important to remind ourselves of the fact that the civilization of the Bantus was expressed through their economy, system of government, system of inheritance, and religion. A few of these as reminders are discussed um, here and there. So again, it is telling you that before our contact with anybody, we were pretty much a civilized people who had developed institutions. The African was pretty much civilized and had developed social and political institutions. So once again, as students of African history, it is never true that it was because of our contact with the outsiders that was when you know, our civilization began to blossom. It is not true. From all that we have studied from the beginning up to now, it tells you clearly that we had a civilization, social and politically, and before our contact with the outside world. An area the Bantus expressed their civilization was through pottery work. Here, they made magnificent pottery and with complex um, designs on them. The designs had philosophical meanings. Once again, as people were writing, 
um, philosophies and all, the African was expressing his philosophy through the arts. So through clay work, through carvings, through designs on, on cloth and all of that, that was how the African expressed his deep thinking philosophies. So once again, it is never true that the African was not civilized. The African was deeply civilized and he expressed deeper thinking, probably not through the art of writing, but through the arts. And the example is um, there to show for itself. They practice matrilineal system of inheritance. That is inheritance passing on from a man to his sister's son. I mean, how could they have come out with this system? It tells you how deep um, thinkers our forebears were. With the passage of time, Bantu groups like the Luba change over to practice patrilineal system of inheritance. The Bantus also developed compact villages which were governed by councils of the older men. Clearly tells you that politically they were inclined, politically they were exposed, they believed in the wisdom of the, of the, of the old age, and so um, their villages were man steered in terms of affairs by older people who, you know, had a better sense of governance. And so before our contact with anybody from anywhere, the African was civilized, and his civilization was expressed as I have said, through several forms, through systems of governance, through social institutions, and philosophies were expressed deeply through the arts. So we walk and we walk just high because we have been a people of civilization. And last but not the least, the Bantu also practice polygamy. Their men could marry more than one wife. They could marry more than one wife. All right, so moving on, today we will, our focus will be on Bantu economy and their social and political organizations. Today, the focus from all that we have been discussing, we are again looking at the Bantu economy and their social and political organization. Bantu economy, the economy, obviously, um, the means by which they lived and how they took care of themselves and how they sustained themselves um, economically. That is what we are going to be looking at. And their social and political organizations. I hope you are still with me. You are enjoying our class. This is Bantu, Bantu civilization. And we have said, let me remind ourselves one more time, that the Bantus today can be found in over 27 countries, spoken in about 100 million people. These people are found in the southern part of the continent of Africa, and in the eastern part, and in the central part. Where did they come from? Linguistics evidence, linguistics evidence has proven that the Bantu's origin could be traced to West Africa. And West Africa, we are looking at the middle Benue River Valley area in Nigeria. So if this is the case, then it means that the African people, we are one. So there's no need for any xenophobic attack anywhere. If you attack somebody in the southern part of the continent, bearing in mind that your roots come from West Africa, then it means we are harming our own selves. And so the African history is critical in the social, economic, and even political development of this continent. All right, let's progress. The indigenous Bantu economy thrived generally on the following activities. The indigenous Bantu economy thrived generally on the following activities. Keeping livestock, keeping livestock. They kept cattle, sheep, and goats which pro provided them with milk, meat, hides, and skin. This is so true in a sense that when you go to the southern part, particularly Namibia, keeping cattle is something that they don't joke with. So what we are studying, the evidence is clearly there to show for. So the indigenous Bantu economy hinged one on keeping livestock, keeping livestock, put it down, keeping livestock. Farming, farming. They grew grains, pulses, and root crops such as cassava, arrow roots, potatoes, and yams, as well as legumes and beans and peas. So in farming, they were into grains. They also planted root crops such as cassava, arrow roots, potatoes, and yams, as well as legumes like beans and peas. Trade. Abaguzi gave their, so these are neighbors, 
they allow um, neighbors grains, iron implements, and soap stones in exchange for livestock, um, salt, hides, milk, pots, baskets. The case was um, similar between the Luhia and the Nandi and Lao neighbors. So they traded among themselves. The neighbors traded among themselves. And so whatever you did not have, the other, your neighbor may have. And then you did, they did the trading among themselves. Fishing. They used hooks and lines, basket nets and fence traps to catch fish. They sold some of the fish they caught to neighboring communities. And as they sold the, 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 the catch, what it meant was that it helped in improving the living conditions of the fishermen over there. Iron working. This enabled them to have better weapons and farm implements, which aided their migration and settlement in various places before they finally settled in their present homelands. So knowledge in iron working was critical. It helped them in the production of implements, tools um, to protect themselves, to farm, and also to even adorn themselves. Because I, I, I believe and I know that in the iron workings, they might have produced some bangles, some earrings, and all of that for the, the African women there. And so in as much as it's enhanced the beauty of the African women, it also served as implements and, um, and farming, I mean, served as weapons and farm implements, which helped them in farming. Crafts, they were good in pottery and basketry, which boosted their trade and other economic activities. It boosted their trade and other economic activities. So when they produced their pots, they produced their jugs and all of that they sold. And out of that, the monies and whatever they had helped them in improving their living conditions. So the people were really on the ground. They knew what they were doing. And this was before contact with anybody from anywhere. So if somebody sits out there and tells you that you have not been part of world civilization, then you know uh, it is not true and it can never be true. Because we, the African, has been the cradle of civilization. And there's no equivocation. The truth is there. All right, so having looked at the social, having looked at the economic activities, um, we are now going to zoom into the political organization of the Bantu people. We have looked at the economic activities of the Bantu, the indigenous economic activities, which help them um, as a way of improving their living conditions. We are now zooming into their political organization. How were they politically organized? How? It is important we get to know. All right. The Bantu had chiefdoms, that is territory or state ruled by chiefs. They had courtesies, they had communities, they had states which were ruled or governed by chiefs, which constituted um, the basic political units. These chiefdoms constituted the basic political units of the Bantus. It included major areas of settlement, grazing grounds, and neighboring villages. Among the Southern Bantu, a tribe was the basic political unit. It was made up of few thousands of people. The tribe consisted of a number of clans, and the most important clan was called the Central Clan, and it provided chiefs for the tribe. And I think we can relate to this even in West Africa, and even in Ghana, um, from among the various um, clans. I mean, there are particular groups where the our chiefs and kings come from. So, for example, the Oyoko is one of those that um, places where the chiefs come from, the Oyoko clan, it is so clear and direct. That is a central um, clan, if you like. And this can be uh, related to by what was happening or what happens in the southern part of the continent occupied by the Bantus. The chief among the Bantu was held by his close relatives who helped um, subordinate positions and offices. We are saying that the chief among the Bantu was helped in governance. The chief did not rule all by himself um, arbitrarily, no. The chief being so democratic, I mean the community being so democratic within their own perspective, ruled together with relatives who were close. And these were subordinate people who held subordinate positions and offices. So the chief always had people to help him 
in governance. And who said this is not democratic? This is too much democratic. The chief's position was the most important in all um, aspects of life, such as military, judiciary, and religious aspect. Yes, so when it's about declaration of war, it is the chief who um, declared he was a commander of the military, and also in terms of religion, he stood between the living and the dead. And this is also pretty much the same in West Africa, or here, or among the various clans and, and groupings that we have. The political or judicial decision taken by the king was final. And I know that with the help of his um, helpers, supporters, any decision that the king took was not arbitrary. He always took the decisions by consulting the others who help him in governance. So we are saying that his political and judicial decisions were always taken by the king and was final. Because, of course, he is the king. The chiefs ruled according to the established rules and practices accepted by the people of the society. So clearly, once again, there is a constitution there. The king or the chief ruled according to rules and practices accepted by the people. This might not be a written down book called a constitution. These are norms. These are things that they followed. And this is purely democratic enough. Purely, purely democratic enough. So the chiefs ruled according to established rules and practices accepted by the people of the society. So the moment the chief went beyond these accepted practices and principles, the obvious was likely to happen that the chief might be distilled. The chief might be distilled. And that's exactly the same with our constitution. If the president acted um, against the constitution, there were consequences. And it's exactly the same that our traditional rulers, our forebears, deep, deep, deep thinkers, were also doing. For example, he consulted small clan councils on various matters. So the chief never did anything on his own accord. He always consulted. And that was um, a clear sign of respect for traditional institutions and the society and a clear manifestation of democracy. The chief presided over inter-clan conflicts such as murder and territorial aggression, as well as land conflicts. So the chief presided over inter-clan conflict. Anytime there was a conflict, it was the chief who presided over to bring amicable solutions to whatever challenge that uh, may be raising its ugly head. Also, murder cases. So the king was the judge, and he dispensed justice in consultation when um, needed, and he did so justly. The ancestors of the chiefs were regarded as guardian spirits of the whole community, and the tribe name um, was either taken from that of the outstanding ruler or leader. Permanent ownership of land was not recognized among the Bantu. So there was always the, the communal ownership um, type of, of relationship that existed in the Bantu communities. The, the Ubuntu we live for each other. Nobody owned anything for himself or herself. It was a communal ownership, communal ownership. That's why they said permanent ownership of land was not recognized among the, the, the Bantu. There was always communal, communal ownership. All right. So having looked at the political organization, clearly a democracy practicing there, clearly respect for traditional institutions and um, customs and practices, uh, let us quickly look at the social organization of the Bantu people, the social organization of the Bantu people. I trust we're enjoying what we are doing. I know. Why? Because it is about ourselves. It's about our history. And so it is important we attach all seriousness when it comes to ourselves, our history. We need to pay attention to it. So the social relations of the Bantu were based on their family. Hence, the family formed the smallest social unit. Members of the same clan lived near one another. Their hearts formed a family compound. A number of families made up a lineage under the leadership of one senior man or an elder. A number of lineages made up a clan, and the most powerful clans provided chiefs. Members of the same clan shared a common name and could not intermarry until many generations had passed. And I think it is the same 
for I mean, the clans that we also have in, in our country, Ghana, here. Um, from of old, people belonging to the same clan were not supposed to marry, even though due to, um, if you like, weathering and seasoning, influences from other places, these things seem not to be invoked as uh, such, but that's exactly what they were practicing. If you belong to the same clan, you were deemed to be one, and so you could not marry. Initiation ceremonies were common among the Bantu, just as it is also here, the Depot, the Bragros, and the rest. For example, the Soto and Nguni boys were initiated into manhood. Here, in our various um, communities, boys were initiated into manhood when they became hunters at the time or when they became wood carvers and, and, and were able to do things for themselves. Then they had been initiated into manhood. Same was happening in Bantu land um, and in communities and, and clans like the Soto and Nguni boys that was, they also had some initiation rights. Marriage among the Bantu only took place after boys had been initiated into manhood, yes. The Nguni and the Soto were polygamous and wives were placed in different homes, states, with a fixed order of respect and privilege. The first wife received much respect in society. They inherited matrilineally. Again, confirming the fact that the African is so much family oriented. The African is so much family, um, uh, yes, or oriented. He respects family and he values women in, in the family. And for that matter, marriage. According to the African, marriage is between the man and the woman. The intermarriages that ensued between the Bantus and the indigenous population of Central, Southern, and Eastern Africa had far-reaching consequences. First, it created a population with different physical features. Of course, the Bantus, after they had migrated from, uh, from West Africa, got to Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa, met some indigenous people. They intermarried with them, and obviously, the generation that came after had different features. So most importantly, it led to the rise of complex societies in modern Shaba, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and Eastern Zari between the 12th and 15th centuries. Three of these complex societies will be discussed in our next meeting. I mean, this is how we, we get ourselves involved in our, in our past. So that we, I mean, as I've said, now your interest has been generated and you want to really know um, these complex societies that we are talking about. These are African complex societies that will blow your mind when we start discussing next week. So in short, we've looked at the Bantus. We did a quick um, review of what we did the last time. We looked at the migration pattern, where they originated from and where they are today. And I've also given you an assignment that the, the 27 countries that I mentioned kindly write down their capital cities. It is important for me. I'll come around. We looked at the economy, the indigenous economy of the Bantus. We looked at it from fish farming to livestock keeping to trading and what have you. So if a question comes and you are looking at the Bantu, indigenous Bantu economy, um, I know that it wouldn't be difficult at all for you. Then we looked at the social organization. First, we looked at the political and we saw that the Bantus were heavily democratic in their um, political organization. Um, the chiefs never did anything by themselves. They always consulted, and they also made sure that they followed the traditional rules and norms accepted by the community. We have again looked at a social organization where we have said that they respected marriage, they valued marriage, they were polygamists, and first wives were seriously valued. And according to them, and within the African setup, marriage has always been between the man and the woman. All right, I trust that the discussion has been healthy. You have enjoyed it. We are looking at Bantu. We haven't finished. We'll be looking at the various complex, complex societies. All right, so in summary, today we have looked at the indigenous Bantu economy, as I've said, and their socio-political organization. We realized that Bantus were engaged in several economic activities, among which were farming, trading, fish farming, etc. I mean, I just said it. Also, Family was at the core of their social life. Family was at the core. It is important to point out that they had a structured political organization where the chiefs, in consultation with the clan heads, steered affairs of the communities. 
nobody did anything anyhow. The leaders were very concerned and, and, and they respected the traditional systems and, and customs. So in our next meeting, in our next, which I'm looking forward so much to, we'll be looking at some complex Bantu societies. And to begin with, kindly read on societies like Mapungugwe. Please, the name is an African name. So pronounce it well and read it, read on them. Mapungugwe, Kesali, Zimbabwe, Munumutapa. Read something on them, because next week, that is what we'll be looking at. So thank you for joining me and sticking with me. Same time next week, hey, my African friends, let's meet here for our history, the African history. But as we do it always, I have an assignment, a quick one, simple one for you. Kindly work on it. Discuss four indigenous economic activities of the Bantu people and briefly discuss the social and political organization, again, of the Bantu people. This should be easy for you, and I know you will do it. So it's always been fun sticking with you, coming your way and discussing our past, discussing our history, because without our history, we are nobody. It's important we get to know our past so that we can walk comfortably and, and share our history with others. People who probably might think that we have never had history, we've never been part of world civilization, but then we are saying it boldly that we are the cradle of civilization. So thank you so much. My name is Frank Eduasari. Um, I'm your friend in discussing African history topics. Um, some resource materials, my friends, you could just go and get them. Um, Wool of Series, History of Africa for Senior High Schools in Ghana. Go to University of Ghana Bookshop, and I'm sure you get it. Um, also, you know, there's some contacts. Just call, and you might have some, not only for the students. I'm telling you, parents and, and everybody, we need to know our past. It's very important. Our rich past, so that we can walk chest high and, and, you know, feel comfortable. Because when we know the greatness of our past, it helps us to drive along smoothly today and into the future. Thank you so much. Same time next week. I will come your way. Bye bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.